In the past 70 years, US real GDP has increased ninefold, from $2 trillion to around $19 trillion. Yet despite this massive increase in wealth, are Americans happier than they were in the past? If your salary doubled tomorrow, how much happier would you be? Economics has often focused on maximizing GDP and income. Yet in the past few decades, this approach has become increasingly questioned as we realize the limitations of GDP and income. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson wrote, we have the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He made no mention of maximizing GDP, but sometimes in economics, we invariably fall into the trap of maximizing output and income and ignoring wider social implications. Now, first of all, it's very important to bear in mind that rising GDP can be very important, especially for developing countries who have widespread poverty, economic growth, and an increase in real incomes. It's very important for lifting people out of poverty. And in the past 40 or 50 years, economic growth has played a crucial role in reducing poverty across the world. And you can see here the extent to which absolute poverty has fallen. And so this is the real importance of enabling higher incomes. However, there comes a point when increasing income no longer leads to this increase in happiness and well-being. There's a well-known uh, concept called the Easterlin paradox. And this was an economist, Richard Easterlin. And he noted that when an economy develops and gets richer, there comes a point where measures of well-being no longer increase. In other words, we plateau and that rising income makes no difference to our state of mind and well-being. So why is this? Why does GDP only increase happiness up to a point? Well, one very important concept is the diminishing marginal utility of money. Supposing you're very poor and somebody gives you £100, then this is a real increase in your welfare because you can go out and afford to buy food and pay your rent. But if you're a millionaire and somebody gave you £100, there's very little that you could do with this £100 because you've already bought most of the things that you already need. So you might feel a little happy you have another £100 in the bank, but it's very minor compared to the uh, benefit to a homeless person who gets this extra income. And it's the same with GDP. But as GDP rises, initially it was a big benefit, but over time the benefits start to tail off. The second thing is that higher GDP can have its own negative consequences, and in particular the damage to the environment and pollution from higher growth. So 200 years ago we were quite poor, but the environment was in a much better state. 200 years of uh, burning fossil fuels and increased output has led to degradation of the environment, more pollution and global warming, which is imposing quite a lot of costs on people across the world. So this is a problem of higher output. It can cause these negative externalities. Another problem is that rising real GDP isn't necessarily spread equally. And a big problem is that often asset prices like house prices rise faster than average wages. And so while some people become a lot wealthier, those who own property, those who don't own property are face facing very significantly higher rents and cost of living. And this is particularly acute in many Western cities, such as uh, New York, but also uh, London and other cities across the world. So it's not just about how much we increase GDP, but how it is distributed and whether the cost of living uh, keeps up with the rising real GDP. Another problem with potentially rising GDP is it depends how we got there. Because one aspect of higher economic growth is that it can leave people still unsatisfied because they feel the need to strive to work harder, to maximize productivity. And so we can end up placing a lot of stress on ourselves, trying to get a better paid job or firms trying to expand. And even though companies may have a lot of revenue and profits, they may still be unsatisfied and seek to push their workers as far as they can. So a big factor that determines well-being is not just the income that you have, but the amount of leisure time that you have, the quality of life, and whether you can use leisure in a productive use. 
Back in the 1930s, the famous economist John Maynard Keynes predicted that higher productivity would enable his grandchildren to work 15 hours a week and have lots of time for useful leisure pursuits. But by and large, this hasn't happened, even though he was right about rising productivity and income. And it's a paradox that as we get richer, we don't seem to be able to uh, use this wealth in a way that increases our uh, leisure and living standards. Now, although we said there's a limit to how much higher GDP can increase welfare, it's important to bear in mind that actually some economists disagree and say there's actually quite a strong correlation between rising real GDP and measures of well-being. And if you look at the 2022 World Happiness uh, Report, you can see that the countries who top the rankings of the happiest places to live are those countries with high real GDP, places like Finland, Denmark and Iceland. And the worst performing countries in terms of happiness um, is countries like Lebanon, Afghanistan, places with a low GDP and also uh, political turmoil. It's worth pointing out that this World Happiness uh, Report they base their results on surveys of people. Are you satisfied with your life as it is? What are your positive and negative emotions uh, in the recent past? So this is a very subjective, but even on the subjective uh, trends, you can see that uh, richer countries seem to be giving higher returns. Why is that? Well, the report explains these uh, happiness results on a few factors. They say it can be explained by a real GDP per capita, average incomes. Also, it can be explained by healthy life expectancy, freedom to make choices, generosity, do you give to charity, and perceptions of corruption in your country. They might also have added uh, in the environment that you live in and whether it's a good place to live. This suggests that rich countries do have higher well-being but it's worth pointing out that is it the high incomes or is it the uh, political stability, social cohesion? On an individual level, at the start of a video, I asked, would you be happier if your salary doubled? And I'm sure you all um, were tempted to say, yes, I would be happy. And I'd put my hand up too as well. But I think there's a, definitely a case to say that we can easily overestimate the benefits of higher income. There was a study by uh, Daniel Kahneman and Angus Deaton found that emotional well-being tended to rise with a rising salary up until the point of $75,000 a year. And the interesting thing is that after that figure, rising income had no noticeable effect on improving uh, emotional well-being. So it's almost like $75,000 was a sweet spot. So if we kill ourselves working to get a higher paid job, it may have very little effect on improving our well-being. And why is that? Well, again, we can go back to the diminishing utility of wealth and income, that at 75,000, you've got all the basics, but then it's hard to get happiness from consumption. And there's an economist called Tibor Skivotsky, I hope I pronounced that right, and he did a study of happiness back in the 1970s, quite well ahead of his time. And he said the a key to happiness was not consumption, but whether we could pursue worthwhile objectives. So uh, perhaps learning something new, uh, social or music, or doing an activity that gave a lasting sense of satisfaction rather than temporary pleasure. So what is the importance of happiness economics? Well, firstly, we have to be aware of the limitations of GDP. And one way we can start is using other indexes to measure living standards. There's actually a huge range that we can choose from. The Human Development Index, the Genuine Progress Indicator, and you can see how the Genuine Progress Indicator may give different results to GDP per capita. And when we start to use these different indexes, policy will change because rather than maximizing output and monetary value, we'll also consider greater uh, range of factors such as the environment and how people's lives are genuinely affected. So it's quite an interesting new development in economics because it broadens the scope and it makes a more complex and detailed approach to actually improving people's living standards and not just uh, easy to measure GDP statistics. On a personal level, it's also interesting to think about what do we want from life? Do we want to 
work 50, 60 hours a week in order to have a very highly paid job? Or is there a better way of managing our work-life balance? On a personal level, I used to teach 40 hours a week, but I had a desire to work less, to spend more time cycling and gardening. And so I set up a website and uh, back in 2006, and it was less income than I could have got at the time, but I was able to do uh, more things outside work. And it's a decision I definitely don't regret. And when I was teaching economics, I often used to ask my students, what uh, do you want to do? And what's important in your job that you choose? And they hadn't really thought about it too much. Many instinctively said they wanted the highest paid job possible, but um, there's much more to life than getting the best paid job. And uh, after finishing university, a lot of my friends went off to the city, worked 50, 60 hours a week, but I don't regret not joining them, even though uh, teaching in Oxford was slightly less late paid. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. And if you have any thoughts on happiness economics, feel free to leave a comment and um, I'll be back next week.